Hello and welcome to a summary of all you need to know about the poem If by Rudyard Kipling. Now, I'll explain the meaning related to this poem as it appears in part three of the Pearson Edexcel International GCSE Anthology. Now, do bear in mind that, in contrast to part one of the anthology, which featured only non-fiction texts, and part two, which was a mix of fiction, short stories and poems, part three of the anthology exclusively features poems alone. So, in this video, I'll highlight key language and literary devices used in the poem and you'll learn how to analyse it. So, let's get started. Now, what I'll do is I'll read parts of each stanza, Pause every so often and then highlight important literary techniques that you should annotate if you're reading this as well. So let's begin. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting or being lied about, don't deal in lies or being hated, don't give way to hating, and yet don't look too good nor talk too wise. If you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two impostors just the same, if you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools or watch the things you gave your life to broken and stoop and build them out with worn out tools. Now, this opening part of the poem essentially appears to be almost a way of advising somebody how to deal with all the positives that life brings one, but also all the negatives. Now, the title of the poem itself, If, is quite brief, it's mysterious, and this title in many ways suggests uncertainty, and of course, this reflects the uncertainty that we all feel as we progress through life, which is filled with a lot of unpredictable events. Now, this poem from the outset repeats if several times and this conditional clause is consistently repeated. Again, this shows how life can be unpredictable and this is the speaker's way of stating if you're in one situation or another situation, this is what you should really do and have as your grounding principles. Now, the first line, if you, now the second person pronoun shows, as I've mentioned before, that this is a form of advice to somebody. We don't know who's been talked to, but perhaps we can presume here initially that it's us as readers that are being advised by Rudyard Kipling or the narrator who might not be Rudyard Kipling. Now, the second person pronoun is repeated. And again, this emphasizes, this repetition emphasizes to us that we really need to adopt these principles as we progress through life. Moreover, we're told in the first line, if you can keep your head, and this is an interesting phrase, keep your head, because this is quite colloquial, it's quite casual. And again, what this does, this kind of casual reference is quite disarming for us when we're being advised. Moreover, at the end of this first line, there's an jambon, and what this does is it speeds up the pace of the poem. Also, the idea of keeping your head when others are losing theirs. Now, this references how people can act irrationally and the importance of us acting rationally and thinking in a really rational manner in spite of other people around us not being too rational. Then the speaker states, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, and this is an oxymoron, the contrast between trust and doubt, and this emphasizes the importance of self-belief. Also in line five, if you can wait and not be tired by waiting, and the repetition of the verb wait emphasizes the importance of patience and resilience within all of us. Furthermore, the repetition of the conjunction or emphasizes the different scenarios and it compounds with the use and the repetition of the conditional clause if. Moreover, there's the use of caesura uh, or being lied about, don't deal in lies. And again, what this does is it slows down the pace. It creates in some ways a very comforting tone. It's almost as if a parent is advising their child or we are put in the position of children or people that need this advice. And the caesura slows down the pace of the speech as opposed to Anjan Mond, which speeds it up. Moreover, we are advised as readers don't deal in lies. And this imperative sentence in many ways really solidifies the message of this poem, this idea that it's really, really sound advice that should really guide us through our daily lives. Moreover, the speaker, the anonymous speaker states, 
and yet don't look too good nor talk too wise. And these intensifiers are being used in terms of emphasizing the importance of being moderate and adopting a really moderate approach when doing different things, not be focused too much on looking too good, so being focused on how others perceive us and also, of course, how others might think we're too wise. So it's really important through this intensifier, at least being emphasized, of being a moderate person, but equally not necessarily being showy and so on. Moreover, in line nine, if you can dream and in line 10, and if you can think now the mention of dreaming, but also thinking emphasizes the importance of contemplation, dreaming, but also action, doing, putting into thoughts all your dreams. Moreover, the speaker states not make dreams your master. And this metaphor advises against being too obsessively ambitious. Moreover, there's a lot of caesura in this part of the verse. And furthermore, there's this emphasis of being able to meet triumph and disaster. Now, this again is oxymorons. Triumph and disaster are opposites. And what this does is it emphasizes the unpredictability of life. You have lots of wins, but also lots of losses, and you need to be able to adapt to these challenges. Furthermore, triumph and disaster are characterized as two imposters. Treat these two imposters just the same. So this personification shows that actually, interestingly enough, meeting and experiencing triumph, but also experiencing disaster, this can be very deceptive. If we experience too much triumph, we think that we're invincible. If we experience too much disaster, sometimes this can destroy our self-relief. We shouldn't be guided too excessively by either. Moreover, in the next line, if you can bear to hear the truth that you've spoken, and again, there's a Montmont here, which speeds up the pace of the poem. And then it states, the truth you've spoken twisted by knaves and make a trap for fools. And there's alliteration here, twisted and trapped. And what this emphasizes is people will use your words against you. They will falsely accuse you sometimes, but it's really important to anticipate that, but also not be trapped by this. In line 15, or watch the things you've given your life to broken. Now, the hyperbole here reveals a shock of loss that many of us through the course of our lives will have to experience and the importance of not being broken by loss. Moreover, there's more colloquialisms used, more colloquial language in line 16 and stoop and build them up, M meaning them. And again, this colloquialism highlights the importance of being of reinvention after huge setbacks. In other words, even if we lose everything, we should be able to brush ourselves off and also reinvent ourselves. So let's carry on. If you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss and lose and start again at your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss, if you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they are gone, and so hold on when there's nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue, or walk with kings nor lose the common touch, if neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men count with you, but none too much. If you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and everything that's in it. And, which is more, you'll be a man, my son. Now, this final part of the poem is really intriguing. So in this part, essentially, the speaker states, if you can make one heap of all your winning, and there's a lot of language relating to gambling used, winnings, risk, pitch and toss. And so this is language related to betting, and this belongs to the semantic field of betting, and it shows the action of gambling. In many ways, what this emphasizes is life is one big gamble. We never quite know how things are going to turn out. Also 920, and never breathe a word about your loss. And again, this imperative sentence shows that one should not openly bemoan the loss too heavily. Moreover, in the following line, if you can force your heart and nerve and sinew, and the rule of three here, heart, nerve, sinew, symbolizes the importance of willpower in spite of losses, in spite of difficulties. Furthermore, in spite of these difficulties, the speaker states, force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they are gone. And the emphasis on serving your turn shows the importance of focus, determination. So there's, this is a lot of metaphorical language in terms of talking about the importance of all power and staying even other, when others are giving up. Moreover, there's the pronoun they that's used. And this is a reference to how most people in society tend to give up. They tend to get discouraged too quickly and the importance of being the exception to this rule. Furthermore, there's an here, which again speeds up the pace of the poem. 
and the speaker states accept the will which says to them hold on and this abstract noun will highlights and references the inner voice that we should all have to just keep us going moreover in line 25 if you can talk with crowds and keep your virtues or walk with kings now there's this juxtaposition between crowds and kings this contrast between royalty kings and commoners crowds of people and the speaker is actually telling the listener or us that we should treat both similarly Moreover, in line 25, keep your virtue. And again, this abstract noun, which compounds the previous abstract noun in the other line, will, it shows the importance of having very good virtues and good morals. Also, walking with kings. Walk with kings. This is alliteration. Again, this emphasizes this idea that you can be both associated with common people and never look down on them, but equally, you can walk with people who perhaps are part of the elite and not be too taken by that and this is further emphasized with the alliteration moreover there's the use of sozuri here which then emphasizes and places even more focus on the importance of not losing the common touch that follows afterwards then if neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you now there's oxymoron again here foes and friends and what this shows actually is interestingly both have the ability to harm us our foes our enemies can harm us but equally our friends can really let us down they too can betray us and what the speaker is trying to show is that we shouldn't be too excessively naive when dealing with either also in line 29, if you can feel the unforgiving minute, and again, personification here shows that time is relentless, time is unforgiving, it continues, it pauses for no man. Now in line 30, with 60 seconds worth of distance run, and this is a metaphor for how brief life is, it's only 60 seconds and it's gone and it's finished and it's important to fill your life with important things, to do the right thing in your life and to live a life that you're quite proud of. Then the speaker states, yours is the earth, and this is hyperbole stating in many ways that if you are able to do this, if you're able to hold on to these morals, if you're able to keep on going, then you will inherit the earth. And this is to some degree biblical language, blessed are thee who are meek, they shall inherit the earth. And then the poem, or rather the speaker, ends with, you'll be a man, my son. And now we realise who is being talked to. So we now, at the end of the poem, realise that it's a speaker, presumably a father, speaking to their son. And this is a really perfect example of cataphoric reference. Cataphora is when the subject is later revealed much, much later. Thus, here, this exclamatory sentence reveals the speaker is actually advising his son on the importance of self-belief. So that's all. If you found this video useful, do note that we have an in-depth extensive course covering all the texts and poems in part one, two, and three of the entire Pearson at Excel International GCSE anthology. So do make sure you sign up for this course for explanations on all of these texts and all of these poems, as well as model answers when it comes to writing about these different texts. Also make sure you check out our website, www.firstratetutors.com, where you will find plenty of English revision worksheets, model answers, and online courses covering all the major English syllabuses, including Excel, AQA, and IGCSE. So thank you so much for listening.